Hi everyone! Welcome back to another Planetarium live stream. My name is Jessica. I am the director of the Planetarium. And with me tonight are two probably familiar faces if you've seen any of our shows in the past, but I will still let them introduce themselves, starting off with Lindsay since she is to my left. Hi, I'm Lindsay. I'm a physics graduate student at UMD. And I'm, you know, I'm a physics undergraduate student at UMD. So tonight we are um, doing a new iteration of the show. Uh, if you've been to the planetarium in the past, you may know we used to have a show called Mythbusters Astronomy. And Eli this summer has been revamping that and we have renamed it Astronomy Factor Fiction. Uh, and so I am going to turn it over to Eli, who is going to walk us through some common uh, ideas, misconceptions, things like that um, um, around astronomy. And we'll hopefully learn a little something. Um, yeah. So Eli, take it over. Um, well, bear with me for a second while I get my screen shared. And I will also say, if you do have any questions throughout, um, put them down in the comments. I will be watching out for those. And if we don't get to them right away, uh, we will take time at the end to answer those questions. You get Eli? Okay, is that yep. looking good? Okay, excellent. Now let me just get my little black sheet up. At least I think it's somewhere. Um, okay, sorry, just a minute. I might have to exit out and then we get the presenter view up. There we go. Okay, I think that should be good. All right, so are you still looking at the right screen? Yep. Okay, cool. All right, so yeah, astronomy fact or fiction. Um, just kind of, we're, we're kind of gonna do it in like a like a trivia format. Um, so I will give you the prompt and you guys can play at home um, and uh, kind of make your guess and then we'll, I'll give the answer and then we'll talk through the answer a little bit. So um, the first one that I want to talk about is true or false, um, the moon has a dark side. So I'll give you a second to kind of figure out your answer. Um, and here we go. That is false. The moon does not have a dark side, um, contrary to the belief of Pink Floyd and probably their fans, um, including me for a good portion of my life. Um, but uh, yeah, that is false. The moon uh, does not have a dark side. Um, and uh, in order to understand why that is, we kind of need to talk about something called um, tidal locking. Um, so tidal locking is um, a thing that happens in when things orbit each other, where um, over a long time, millions of years, um, the orbiting object slows down so that it rotates once for every orbit it makes. Um, and uh, so on the left here, you can see what uh, the phases would look like um, or what rather the side of the moon would look like um, if it didn't rotate. So imagine that the red side is the dark side. Um, if it wasn't rotating, well, I suppose I should actually say the purple side is the dark side because that's what it's supposed to be. Um, if it wasn't rotating, the purple side would always be the dark side because it would be facing away from the sun. Um, but on the right hand side, um, that is the situation with tidal locking. Um, since it's actually rotating, the um, illuminated side of the moon changes based on where it is in its rotation and its position. Um, and so there is never one dark side of the moon. It changes um, from day to day. Um, so while there is not a uh, dark side, there is a far side, as you can see. So there's always one side. The purple side is always facing away from Earth. Um, so we actually never see that side. Um, the only people that have ever seen it uh, in person are the uh, astronauts that have orbited the moon. Um, so, and I think this is a really good video that um, kind of shows this. So um, I'm gonna have to skip through it too, I believe, if the slideshow is gonna let me. So this is without any rotation. So this is if tidal locking wasn't there. You can see that the red side, which we'll call the dark side, is always facing the same direction, always facing away from the sun. So it's always gonna be dark. Um, but then if we skip to about here, you'll see how it actually is with the tidal locking. So the red side is always facing the earth 
um, but the side facing the sun is changing. So again, no dark side, just a far side, the side that's not facing the earth. And there it is on one rotation. Okay, um, so the next uh, question, yeah. There, there was no audio on that video. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. All right. Um, so the next question is um, true or false. Um, astronauts on the International Space Station experience no gravity. So again, give you a couple seconds. Um, so that is false. Um, well, it may appear that um, the astronauts on the International Space Station are untethered by Earth's pull. Um, NASA actually found a way to work around that, and that is a pun that you don't know yet, but just I'll remind you of it later for my credit. Um, so uh, to kind of look at what's going on when a body orbits, um, we're going to watch parts of this video. To show how gravity works on Earth and in the skies, Newton designed a thought experiment. He imagined firing a cannon from the top of an extremely tall mountain. From his first law of motion, he knew the cannonball would travel in a straight line at a constant speed forever. But gravity pulls the ball downward. If its speed is low, the cannonball hits the earth near the mountain. The higher the speed, the farther away the ball lands. If you throw it faster, it comes skip farther away, away even faster, earth. You can imagine that if its speed were high enough, the cannonball would travel all the way around the earth and settle into orbit. The orbit of the cannonball around the Earth was a balancing act between the cannonball's tendency to fly off in a straight line and it's being yanked back towards the center of the Earth continuously by the force of gravity. So All right, so we're, that's where we'll pause. Um, and then we're going to kind of look at a picture that maybe illustrates this in a more visible way. Um, so these white arrows um, are kind of the the... the forces acting on um, acting on a cannonball or in our case a satellite or the International Space Station. So um, the white arrow pointing down towards the earth is gravity um, and then the white arrow pointing outwards um, in a straight line is uh, kind of the momentum of the object that's moving. So if the momentum and the gravity um, are kind of same or the momentum is small the object is just going to fall right back down to earth but if the momentum is much larger in that direction the arrow is going to curve along the Earth and um, the satellite will fall into orbit. So all an orbit is, is the object is falling towards the Earth, but at the same rate that it's falling, it's also traveling along the curvature. So it never hits the ground. It just goes in a circle around it. Um, and that's what the International Space Station is doing. Um, so when the International Space Station is moving like that, the astronauts experience um, weightlessness, um, but they don't experience a lack of gravity. Um, it's just that the gravity is kind of counteracted by the object's motion. They still experience 90% of the gravity um, experienced by people on the surface of the Earth. So the way I often explain it is everything is falling the same way. So not only are the astronauts falling around the Earth, but so is the space station. And that's why it has this perceived weightlessness because everything is falling at the same rate around the Earth. Mm -hmm. It, it's just like the the um, Mythbusters elevator thing, where if there was an elevator moving and then you were moving along with it, like if it was falling and you jumped, you're still falling with the elevator. But since you're not, you know, touching the ground on it, it just feels like you're weightless because you're falling along the elevator moving. Um, that probably wasn't a great way to explain it. I haven't seen the Mythbusters episode in a while, but that does ring a bell in my mind. Um, okay, so the next question: um, True or false? Um, the sun is a yellow orangish color. So again, give you a second. And here we go. That is false. Um, the sun actually emits all colors. Um, and we know that when all colors combine, it turns into white. Um, so we're going to kind of jump through a couple hoops to talk about this. The first one I want to talk about 
is exactly what light is. Um, so light uh, comes in these little packets called photons um, and photons behave like particles and they behave like waves. We're going to talk about the waves right now. Um, so waves have a, something called a wavelength and a frequency. Um, and the wavelength of light determines what kind of light it is. So for example, humans, we see visible light, um, which is a very small range in the, in the entire wavelength spectrum of light. Um, and uh, visible light expand, extends from about one one hundredth of a micrometer to 10 micrometers. So that's what we, that's the area of light that we see, but there's much more light on either side of that. Um, so, uh, and this wavelength determines um, the, the properties of the light or some, some of the properties. Um, and uh, so, okay, now we know what wavelength is. Um, now we're gonna talk about how wavelength uh, relates to uh, temperature and color. So this is a very poor quality graph and there's a lot going on. I apologize, I couldn't find many better ones. Um, but, uh, so we'll talk about how wavelength interacts with uh, temperature. So the hotter an object gets, um, the smaller wavelength of light that comes off of it has. Um, so cool stars like red dwarfs, um, which have a surface temp of about 4,000 Kelvin, um, have a peak wavelength at about 750 nanometers. So I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I'm kind of circling it right now. Um, that's where the it. peak of, okay, ah, awesome. I was really hoping that was gonna work. Um, so this is the peak of cooler stars like red dwarfs. Um, so their peak happens right at the red right there, like you can see. Um, so then warmer stars um, like our sun, which have a surface temp of about 5,300 Kelvin. Um, and Kelvin is just another unit of temperature like Fahrenheit and Celsius. Um, so warmer stars um, like our sun peak at um, 550 nanometers, which is right there. Um, and then even hotter ones like blue stars will peak um, even lower somewhere around like 450, 400. Um, but so for stars like our sun, which is a white star, we can see that the peak is right in the middle of the visible spectrum of light. And we know um, that when all colors combine, um, it, it turns into white. And since the sun emits all of these colors, it peaks right in the middle, those uh, colors all combine to white. So this means that if we were to look at the sun from space, it would look white, right? There we are. There's the sun from the International Space Station. So it is right. So we're, or it is white. Um, so we're right about that. Um, so why do we see color, um, like a colored sun um, here on the surface of the earth? Um, well, this is because our atmosphere messes with the light coming from the sun. So blue light is really easily scattered by our atmosphere. So when it hits the atmosphere from the sun, it scatters around um, and then it bounces off of our atmosphere and then goes into our eyes, which is why we see the atmosphere of the sky looking blue. Um, but the yellow light that comes off of the sun um, doesn't get scattered. So that's why when you look at the sun, which I don't encourage you to do, um, but when you kind of you know glance at it out of the corner of your eye, um, it looks yellow. So it's because only the yellow light um, is coming at you because that blue light got scattered. Um, so then the next question is in the evening, why does it look like it changes color? Um, or why does the sky change color? And that's just because in the evening with more atmosphere to travel through, the blue light is scattered off completely. And then the red light is scattered around more, which is why evening sky looks more red. Um, but yes, the sun is white. It's just that when we see it from down here, we're only seeing a portion of the light coming from it, which is yellow. Okay. I always have heard the joke too that it's a lot easier to tell kids to color the sun by handing them a yellow crayon than by handing them a white crayon. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Um, so just realizing a, realizing a mistake I made, um, I didn't animate the slide so that the answer would come up after. So you guys get a gimme on this one. You can add plus one to your score. Um, true or false, a light year is a measurement of distance. This is true. Um, so we'll talk about what this uh, or how this comes out. Um, so we'll, we'll just do a little bit of quick math. Um, so light travels at um, 671 million miles per hour. Okay, so right there, um, miles per hour. So right there. Um, so if there are 24 hours in a day and um, 365 days in a year, when you do that math out, you get 587 trillion miles per year. That's how far light travels in space. Um, so as you can see, that's quite a long distance um, and gets really messy to write out. And as it happens, a lot of uh, objects of interest in space are much further than light can travel in one year. So we needed to kind of make a new unit. That's why we started using the light year. Um, so rather than saying 587 trillion miles, we just say one light year. 
Um, but another interesting consequence of using this unit um, is that however you state the distance is also how long ago the light you are seeing left the object. So for example, when we see the sun um, right here, um, light left the sun eight minutes ago. That's because the sun is eight light minutes away from us. Um, so that means that the light that we're seeing from the sun is as it was eight minutes ago. So this may seem like kind of trivial and unimportant, but like think about the Andromeda galaxy. The Andromeda galaxy is just over two and a half million light years away. And that means that when we see it, we're seeing it as it was two and a half million years ago. Um, so I'm not saying that this happened, but like an interesting implication of that would be like if some alien civilization went and like vacuum cleanered the, the, the galaxy up, we wouldn't know for two and a half million years because that light hadn't had a chance to reach us. So that's just kind of another interesting implication of using the light year. As a unit of distance. Um, okay, this was one of my favorite ones to do. Okay, I was really real excited quick, about this. Um, yeah. We had a question come in about yeah. um, asking if we could explain the analemma. And I just want to say, um, Dan, we saw your question, and I can actually answer that with Stellarium at the end of the show and give you a good kind of graphic and explanation for that. So I just wanted to acknowledge we saw your question, and I will answer it um, in a little bit. Awesome. Okay. Um, so this is one of my favorite ones to do. I was really excited about this. Um, I didn't really know a lot about this one before I looked into it for the, for the uh, presentation. But the question is, true or false, it's much easier to balance eggs on the equinox. Now, I'm sure some of you have heard this. I didn't hear about it because it was much before my time. Um, but uh, let's look at the answer. False. Okay. The position of the Earth around the sun has a very negligible effect on your ability to balance an egg. So a little bit of background before we go into this. Um, in 1945, Life magazine published an article explaining an egg balancing craze um, taking the Chinese city of Chongqing, I believe I pronounced that right, by storm. Um, and uh, upon the beginning of the Chinese solar term, um, people would bounce eggs on the ground, believing that the solar system was aligned such that balancing the egg would be significantly easier due to some gravitational alignment. Um, and after the article was published, um, the craze came to the United States, um, and it's now just kind of like a myth that we have that you can balance eggs on the equinox, which is false. Um, but uh, let's kind of dive into the logic of the myth. So um, an equinox um, is just the day where um, the sun is directly overhead the equator. And we have two of them a year. Um, and so this means that the gravitational alignment that they're talking about would only make sense for you if you were on the equator which very few places are like Duluth is not on the equator. And in fact, there's actually not a day in the year where the sun is directly overhead Duluth. So this doesn't even work for us, but let's enter a hypothetical situation where it does. Um, so the equinox, um, which is on the left, the, the, the logic of the thing is that the gravity pulling the egg down towards earth would be kind of counteracted by the gravity pulling it up towards the sun, which is directly overhead in this hypothetical situation that never happens. Um, and since the sun isn't like pulling it to the side, it wouldn't roll the egg over. Where on other days, since the gravity of the sun would pull it to the side, it would just roll the egg over. And I actually got to do a little bit of math for this one. I was really excited about it. Um, so if the sun were directly overhead in average sized eggs, which I learned, an average sized egg, which is, um, I learned two ounces, um, the gravitational force it would exert on that egg would be 0.06% as strong as the force, force exerted on it by Earth. So it's already like really negligibly, negligibly small um, and wouldn't contribute to the motion. Um, but again, assuming that the egg is two ounces um, and is sitting on a plywood table, which I also found a study on how eggs move on plywood tables, which I thought was very oddly specific. Um, the force of friction between it and the table, the egg and the table, that is, that prevents it from rolling over is 112 times stronger than the force of gravity if it were pulling the egg to the side. So again, negligible. Um, and then also the, if anything else were to happen, air friction would also prevent the egg from rolling over. Um, so no, the sun's position and where its gravity is pulling doesn't influence the egg's motion at all. The difficulty is finding the balance point of the egg, and that is hard to do because eggs are circular. Well, not circular, that would make it easy to balance, but they're oblong, circular in shape. Um, and also the position of the yolk in the egg will change the center of mass, so it just gets really tricky. Um, although I have a tip for you guys, I tried to balance an egg at home, put salt on the counter. Um, it's hard to see, but it makes it way easier to balance the egg. So if you wanna balance an egg, throw some salt on the counter and set an egg on it, and it should be pretty easy to balance it. 
I think this is probably also a case of like selection bias. Like no one thinks about trying to balance an egg except on the equinox. And so right. they try it and go, oh, hey, it worked. This must be right. But then don't right. try it any other day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I just think I just think it's funny that the sun is never overhead Duluth. So it would only work on the equator to the tropics anyway. Um, OK, so the next question, and I'm not going to move to the slide yet. Um, the next question is true or false. Um, NASA spent millions of dollars researching a space pen when the Russians just sent their astronauts up with, pen with pencils. Okay, give you a minute. Okay, the answer is false. That is the space pen. Um, so um, both agencies uh, began using pencils in space. Um, NASA wasn't behind the curve on that. Um, and then independently, Fisher began making pens that they both agencies bought. Um, so it's, it's not true. NASA was sending pencils up too, but they wanted to find a new way to do it because the, um, the, the lead or the graphite that would come off of the pencils, it would go through the circulation systems and it would mess with machinery and wasn't good for the astronauts to breathe in. Um, so then when Fisher pens, um, came out with the space pen, um, they, um, began using, uh, those, uh, pens instead. Um, however, Na uh, the public didn't react too favorably because NASA spent like $5,000 on pens or something like that. Um, so, um, yeah, here's the, here's the diagram of the pen, um, and how it works. So, um, you have an ink cartridge cartridge in there, but then you have this little pressure chamber. Um, and it wasn't the gravity of the earth pulling the ink out of the pen that would pull the ink, which is what pens on earth do, but it was the pressure from that little chamber that would push the ink out. Um, and that's why it was so hard to do because you didn't have that gravity pulling the ink out. And that's why they needed a space pen in the first place. I actually learned a really interesting story about the space pen though. Um, as one of the astronauts was climbing back into the lunar module on the Apollo 11 mission, um, their life support tank hit the ignition switch for the lunar module um, and broke it. So they, really had no way to return to the lunar orbiter and they would have been stranded on the moon. Um, and since they abandoned all their tools on the moon um, and that, cause they had to have space for the rocks that they wanted to carry back. Um, they had no tools to fix it. Um, but uh, after quick thinking by NASA scientists and one of the astronauts, um, a space pen was jammed in there and used as a switch and it allowed the astronauts to get back to the lunar orbiter. I thought that was very interesting. Um, so, okay, next myth um, or next, you know, fact or fiction. Um, true or false? Uh, moon phases are caused by Earth casting a shadow on the moon. Okay, give me a second. I'll bring the text up for you. Um, the answer is false. Uh, moon phases um, are caused by the moon's position relative to the sun and Earth, not the uh, Earth casting a shadow on the moon. So um, this is a really good diagram. I really like this one um, for showing how this works. Um, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to like just think upon looking at it that the Earth is casting a shadow on the moon, but there's a lot going on here. It depends on these positions and where the sun is. Um, so let's think about it from kind of an outside perspective, not on Earth. Um, if one half of the moon is always illuminated by the sun, um, when we are seeing none of the illuminated side, the moon is going to be right here. So the full illuminated side is going to be facing away from the earth. Um, so then a couple phases later, you're going to get to first quarter, which is where we are seeing half of the illuminated side. Then you go around when we're seeing the whole illuminated side, you're seeing the, uh, the full moon phase. Um, and then it goes back. Um, so that's, uh, the position or the, the phase of the moon depends on how much of the illuminated side of the moon we're seeing at that time. And here is a really good animation that I like. Um, that I saw that I think did a really good job at showing it. So we're starting at a, at a full moon and then we're going to work our way over to the third quarter phase. I'll get my mouse out of there. So here we're seeing one half of the illuminated side um, from earth. Keep on going. And now we are seeing the new moon where we are seeing none of the illuminated side. It's all facing away from Earth. And then we'll work our way around again. 
get to the first quarter phase coming up here. And then from there on, it would just move all the way back to new moon when we are seeing the entire illuminated side of the moon. I think another way of thinking about it too is if it was the Earth's shadow, then we wouldn't see a full moon when the moon is on that side, right? We wouldn't see it the moon more illuminated when it's kind of like behind Earth or whatever. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, and it, it does happen sometimes where the Earth's shadow blocks out the moon, but that's called an eclipse. That's not a moon phase. Um, and we have actually done an entire show on moon phases and eclipses. Um, so you can go check that out um, on our YouTube page or our video section of Facebook if you want to delve into that some more. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure you guys saw it. I forgot to animate another slide. I'm sorry. Another gimme for your score. Um, true or false, black holes pull everything in. Um, this is false. Um, I think there's this, this idea that black holes um, just pull everything in really violently, much more than other stuff does. Um, and there's uh, the, the, the idea that they commandeer objects um, more powerfully than objects like, you know, the same mass, a star of the same masses is, is a uh, misconception. Um, so we're going to watch a short excerpt from one of my favorite videos on YouTube. Um, I love this one a lot. It's from a channel called Vsauce. I would highly recommend you watch it. He makes really good, like, science education videos. Um, so this is going to kind of show us what would happen if the sun were replaced with a black hole like that motion. Now look at the sun. It is not currently a black hole, but we can change that. What we need to do is compress the sun. So let's lock its mass so that it doesn't change while we make its radius smaller. Let's make its radius as small as we can. And, oh, where'd it go? Well, it's still there. It's just become a black hole. Pretty spooky, but now let's look at the rest of the solar system. All right, zooming out. And, huh, nothing's changed. I mean, something's changed. It's colder and darker, but nothing's flying off into space or getting sucked in. You see, by shrinking the sun, we didn't change the direction of down for the planets. They're always being pulled by gravity towards its middle and making it smaller didn't move where the middle was. But also, the strength of that force pulling them to the middle of the sun stayed the same. All right, so there's the clip. Um, it's a little fast. Okay, so I want to make like a little diagram to try to explain um, what's what's going on here. So this equation they're seeing up here looks nasty, um, but it's just that's what gravity. That's how gravity works and how we you do math with it. And the only thing we really need to pay attention to is that um, it is divided by radius squared. And that radius is the distance between you and the center of mass of the other object. Um, so that means that the closer you get to the object, the stronger the force of gravity gets. So if you were imagining, or if you, if you would imagine that this is a star and this is a black hole and they're both the same mass. So say, you know, this star supernovas and somehow keeps the mass and, um, turns into this black hole. Um, the gravitational force out here where my mouse is, which I, I'm just going to do with my mouse right now is going to be the same between the star and the black hole but then the interesting thing that happens is since the black hole is so much more dense and so much smaller you can get so much closer to um, the black hole itself and since you can get so much closer gravity can get so much stronger so um, if you were out here the force of gravity would be the same the only difference is that since it's so much smaller you can get so much closer where gravity can get a lot stronger and then you eventually reach the event horizon um, which is where your escape velocity would have to be greater than light, which we can't do. Um, so like as, as the video showed, if you replace the sun um, in our solar system with a black hole, nothing would change for the planets or anything around there. But since you could get closer to the center of mass, it would just get gravity would get much, much stronger the closer you got. So they don't pull anything in more, more violently um, than uh, any other objects do. Um, so, and yeah, I just thought I'd throw in, this is the picture that we got, what is it, two years ago now, one year ago? God, has uh, it been two years already? I hope not. Um, but just recently we got our first picture of a black hole. Um, and this is what it looks like. This is, uh, the, uh, the accretion disc of stuff that's moving around the black hole um, and moving so fast that it's really hot and shooting light off. Um, and then there's the kind of the shadow of the black hole on the center right there. 
I just thought I wanted to throw that in there because I really like the picture. Um, okay. So the next question, which I think should probably be the last one, doesn't look like we have a ton more time, um, is the seasons, um, true or false, the seasons are caused by Earth's tilt. Give you a second. That is true. Seasons are caused by Earth's tilt. Um, they uh, are not determined by how close the Earth is to the sun, um, which is a misconception. Um, so I just wanted to make a little diagram uh, to try to illustrate this. So in winter, in North Hemisphere's winter, um, that means that the North Hemisphere is kind of facing away from the sun. The, the sun is, or the South, the Southern Hemisphere is more, more of it is facing towards the sun. So if we kind of look at how much light is coming off the sun here, which I just made these little yellow arrows, more of it, much more of it is hitting the Southern Hemisphere and uh, much less of it is hitting the Northern Hemisphere. And it's also hitting the Northern Hemisphere at a more shallow angle, which is going to disperse the heat out. And it's going to be even less effective. But then in the summer, the Northern Hemisphere summer, um, more of the light is going to hit the North Pole and it's going to hit it at a more direct angle, which is why our summers are um, much, much warmer than our winters. Um, so, uh, and then I also have this little uh, animation right here, which I think shows this pretty well. So um, right there is the winter solstice, Northern Hemisphere tilted away, getting much less light. But then as uh, it progresses through the year, we're going to get to the equinox, which is kind of the in-between point. And then we would get to the uh, summer solstice, which is where we are tilted towards the sun. So we're getting more of its light at a more direct angle. Um, and that's why it is much warmer in the summer than the winter. And then the interesting thing is, is that if you live close to the equator, um, your seasons aren't going to change as drastically because you're going to be much, much closer. So we get more harsh seasons up here because we're tilted further away. Um, but then closer to the equator, there's not that much change. So your seasons aren't going to change as much. Um, so yeah, I think I'll probably call it there. Yeah. And this is also a really good segue into Dan's question about the analema. Yeah. Um, uh, so it is based off of this, uh, tilt since the earth is tilted. Um, that means, uh, again, since our tilt towards and away from the sun, um, kind of changes throughout the year as we orbit, that makes mm -hmm. the sun appear at different heights in the sky. And so as we move towards summer, uh, the sun appears higher and higher in the sky because we're tilted more and more towards it. Right. And in winter, um, it gets lowered lower in the sky because we're tilted more and more away from it. And that's what creates that analema figure eight pattern uh, that you can mm -hmm. see. Um, so yeah, that was a great segue into answering that question. Um, should I bring my should I bring my my screen share back? Oh no, okay, we'll change no, the camera. You're good. All right, cool. But yeah, well, great job, Eli. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, we I don't see any other questions. We do have um I believe it's your mom, Greta okay. Bernardoff. Yep. Hang um, on. wanting to know if you're reporting from the Millennium Falcon. I am in the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon. I'm sorry, I didn't tell you where I was. <laughs> Um, I am in the cockpit. Chewie's, I'm waiting. Chewie's grabbing a drink in Senex, so he'll be back out soon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if you do have any other questions, now is a great time to leave them down in the comments for us. And while um, I give it a minute to see if uh, we do have any other questions come in, let me give you a little um, kind of look ahead of what's coming up the next few weeks. Um, so on Wednesday, we are going to take you on a, an adventure through the universe where we're going to see as much as we can of the universe in about 30 minutes. There's a lot. Um, and then on Saturday, Lindsay is going to um, fascinate us all with furry physics, um, telling us how animals and insects in the um, animal kingdom use physics in their day-to-day -day life. And it's incredibly fascinating like i learned so much uh when you did this the first time that yeah, was cool it's really fun and then uh the week after that is our virtual dark sky caravan um some of you may know that for the past two summers we have taken our telescopes and our portable planetarium up the north shore um, and spent a week kind of celebrating the dark skies that we have up here um, unfortunately, with the pandemic, we did not feel that that was safe to do this year, uh, but we still wanted to celebrate, and so we have moved it online, uh, where we'll have our virtual dark sky caravan the week of August 24th. Um, so for the 24th through 29th, 
We will be doing nightly shows at 7, and then if the weather cooperates, we will also have a live stream um, through one of our telescopes at 8.30. And we're going to have lots of different topics. A full schedule will be coming out soon. We're still getting the um, all of our partners that are going to be helping us um, confirmed. Uh, but it's going to be it's going to be a fun, exciting week with lots of great stuff. So we hope mm. to see you there as well. Um, I am not seeing any more questions, so I think we will wrap it up there. Uh, thank you, everyone, so much for joining us. Thank you, Eli, for the awesome show. Um, I give everyone a little teaser of what we will have once we can safely open the planetarium back up. And um, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend, and we'll see you again next time. So bye, everyone. <laughs>